If you're viewing this, you've pressed the Help button under the Treatment Efficiency Methodology module to get more information about how the BMP Trains model calculates runoff generation and estimation. Runoff generation is a function of a number of factors including precipitation, soil types, and land cover, and all of these must be considered when estimating runoff generation. Whenever a, a parcel undergoes development and is transformed from the natural condition to developed conditions, a number of, of hydrologic changes occur. Runoff generally increases from the natural condition where runoff might represent only 10% of the precipitation which falls on the site. Uh, moving upward as you increase the percentage of paved surfaces, uh, increasing to as much as 55, 60% or more of the precipitation volume uh, under a completely developed parcel. Estimation of runoff is important uh, for determining the impacts from development. Now, runoff estimation involves a number of factors. As we said before, it includes land use, the amount of impervious surfaces which are present, it has to include the soil types, the topography, and the amount of precipitation and the characteristics of that precipitation. The BMP Trains model estimates runoff using relationships which were developed by Harper and Baker in 2007 for FDEP, which are summarized in the document titled Evaluation of Current Stormwater Design Criteria within the State of Florida. The modeling was conducted using the SCS curve number methodology since that is a model which is uh, familiar to virtually all engineers uh, within the state of Florida. The model is used to calculate annual runoff coefficients for different meteorological sites within the state. Now many of you may be already familiar with runoff coefficients. The concept of a runoff coefficient is commonly used in the rational formula uh, to calculate uh, pipe sizes and in that case the C value that's used in the rational formula represents the runoff proportion for large storm events. And tabular values are available for C values for use with the rational equation and many of you have probably seen tables similar to this where different land uses are summarized and runoff coefficients are provided for each of these. However, these runoff coefficients do not reflect the annual runoff potential from a parcel but rather reflect runoff generation for large scale storm events that are commonly used for pipe, uh, for sizing of pipes. The SCS curve number methodology is outlined in the NRCS document TR55 which is called Urban Hydrology for Small Watersheds. It's a very common model. It's used in many public and proprietary models and the curve numbers themselves reflect rainfall runoff relationships as a function of soil type and soil cover. Now the model basically incorporates two parameters. First, uh, it incorporates the directly connected impervious area, uh, which ranges from zero to hundred percent, reflecting the percentage of the site that is considered to be directly connected. It also incorporates a curve number, which is a measure of the runoff generation potential from pervious areas, as well as impervious areas that are not considered to be DCIA. Typical curve numbers uh, provided in TR55 are summarized here. Uh, there are multiple tables in TR55 and this is a summary of information taken from some of those tables. As you can see, cover types and hydrologic conditions are provided for things like open spaces, uh, and whether they're in poor condition, 
considered to be grass cover less than 50 percent, fair condition, grass cover 50 to 75 percent, and in good condition where the grass cover is greater than 75 percent. Curve numbers are provided for each of the four hydrologic soil groups, hydrologic soil group A, B, C, and D. Notice that the curve numbers increase as the soil uh, number increases, the soil type increases from A to B to C to D as you reflect soils with increasingly higher runoff potential. When you're using the SCS methodology and you're trying to estimate annual runoff coefficients, you need to redefine the concept of a directly connected impervious area. For flood routing, which most of you uh, have used uh, the concept of DCIA before, uh, major events generally consider the DCIA to include all impervious areas for which the runoff discharges into the drainage system. And since you're designing it for a flooding event, the areas that discharge to the stormwater system during these events uh, can be considerably large. For example, shallow roadside swales are often considered to be DCIA for purposes of flood routing. And many times engineers will generously estimate DCIA as a safety factor in design. When you're looking at annual runoff estimation and trying to estimate runoff potential from common rain events, you need to define the DCIA a little more uh, narrowly. The DCIA for common storm events still includes all impervious areas from which runoff discharges into the drainage system, but it doesn't include things like swales or areas which would become flooded since flooding is, is generally not an issue with common daily events. And since the DCI impacts runoff generation very significantly, uh, it needs to be estimated very carefully when you're estimating runoff from common daily events. The SCS curve number parameters uh, calculate a non-directly connected impervious area, referred to as non-DCIA. And that includes all of the pervious areas plus any impervious areas which are not directly connected to the drainage system. For example, in the definition here, we have the area of the pervious parcel, the, the pervious lands on the site, times the curve number that's appropriate for that, times any non-DCIA impervious areas, maybe patios or, or uh, uh, concrete areas in, in yards that are not connected to the drainage system. Uh, and for those, we assign a curve number of 98. And you divide that by the total area to get the non-DCIA curve number value. That number is then used to calculate the soil storage according to this SCS equation. Now, in the BM tree, BMP trains model, the calculations used there have been modified slightly. Two different runoff values are calculated. The runoff from the non-DCIA areas are calculated using the relationship that we just saw. In addition, runoff is also calculated separately from the DCI areas, which are essentially impervious areas, by taking the rainfall and subtracting a tenth of an inch for abstraction. These two are calculated separately because, as we will see in a minute, you can get into substantial errors in estimating runoff when you lump the DCIA and non-DCIA areas into a single curve number. So to calculate annual runoff coefficients, Harper and Baker conduct conducted a continuous simulation of runoff from a, a hypothetical one-acre site using the SCS curve number methodology and historical hourly rainfall for 45 sites in Florida 
which have available historical hourly data. Most of the sites contain more than 30 years of data with an average of over 4,600 events, individual rain events, per site. The data were separated into individual events using a three-hour separation. Now the modeling was conducted for DCIA percentages ranging from 0 to 100 in five unit intervals and for non-DCIA curve numbers from 25 to 95 in five unit intervals. That resulted in 350 combinations for rain per rainfall site and this calculation was conducted for each rain event at each of the 45 hourly monitoring sites for each of these 350 combinations. The annual C value was then calculated as the total runoff depth generated over the 30 plus years of simulation divided by the total rainfall depth which occurred over the same period. The hourly sites used for the modeling are illustrated on this figure. They're located throughout the state of Florida and fairly evenly spaced uh, from the Panhandle down to Key West. The modeling also included adjustments to the curve number to consider dry conditions and wet conditions. The criteria used to establish dry seasons, uh, dry conditions and wet conditions are shown here. For example, if there was less than half an inch in the antecedent five-day period, from October to February, it was considered to be dry conditions and the normal curve number value was corrected using the tabular values shown in the table at the bottom. The same thing for wet conditions. If it rained more than 1.1 inches during the period from October to February, then wet conditions were assumed and the uh, type 3 antecedent moisture condition curve number was assumed. When the modeling was completed, we found some interesting differences in runoff generation throughout the state of Florida. For example, in Pensacola and Tallahassee, for a project consisting of 60 percent DCIA and a 70 non-DCIA curve number, the annual runoff coefficient or C value would be approximately 0.6. However, that same development with 60 percent DCIA and a non-DCIA curve number of 70 constructed in Key West would exhibit a runoff coefficient of only approximately 0.3. Now this has nothing to do with the differences in annual rainfall between Pensacola and Key West, but it has everything to do with differences in the characteristics of the individual events which occur at these sites. In the Pensacola and Tallahassee area, rainfall there is dominated by large events which occur during the uh, spring uh, and, and fall conditions when fronts come through that area and deposit relatively large amounts of rain. However, in Key West, most of the rain is, is provided by relatively small rain events, the majority of which infiltrate into the ground. So in Key West, much of the rainfall infiltrates into the ground, resulting in a lower annual runoff coefficient. The impacts of runoff uh, on rainfall uh, are further illustrated in this figure. This is a figure of the percent of annual rain events less than a tenth of an inch. In areas like Key West and Melbourne, approximately 8% of the annual rainfall volume is less than a tenth of an inch. However, in Pensacola and Tallahassee, only about 4% of the annual rainfall volume is less than a tenth of an inch, meaning that there are fewer events that will totally infiltrate into the ground. If we look at the percentage of annual rain events greater than one inch, 
in Key West and Melbourne, only about 4.5% of the annual rainfall volume is greater than one inch, but in Pensacola and Tallahassee, almost 6% of the annual rainfall volume is contributed by events greater than one inch. So there are differences in rainfall characteristics which affect the annual sea values. To look at it another way, let's look at the annual amount of rainfall that's lost by abstraction. In the Key West and Melbourne area, anywhere from 30 to about 37 percent of the annual rainfall infiltrates into the ground and is lost by uh, abstraction. However, in Pensacola and Tallahassee, that number is closer to 20 percent, again resulting in higher sea values for these areas as opposed to Key West and Melbourne. We took all of the information gathered at each of the 45 hourly meteorological sites and did a cluster analysis to see if there were statistically different uh, relationships or C values for different locations throughout the state of Florida. When we did this, we found that rainfall in the state of Florida can be divided into five different clusters with respect to runoff potential. In other words, areas in the panhandle fit together statistically in terms of the amount of annual rainfall which becomes runoff. There's an area through the center of the state representing cluster two which was statistically similar but statistically different from the panhandle in terms of the fraction of annual rainfall which becomes runoff. There's also an area here along the west coast, an area on the southeast coast, and then the keys themselves represent a distinctly different uh, cluster. So these differences have nothing to do with differences in annual rainfall depths, but simply the amount of annual rainfall which becomes runoff. If we look at, at this graphically, let's take a hypothetical development with a DCIA of 40 percent and a non-DCIA curve number of 70. In zone one, representing the panhandle, the annual C value for that development would be about 0.39, indicating that 39 percent of the annual rainfall which falls on this development would generate uh, runoff. However, in zone two, it's only about 36 percent. In zone three, uh, perhaps 37 percent. A little bit higher in zone four, and about 38 percent in zone five. So again, these differences have nothing to do with the actual rainfall depth, but differences in the types of individual rain events which occur. Now, all of these, this information, the modeling information, was put into a series of tables by Harper and Baker where uh, non-DCIA curve numbers and percent DCIA values were listed and the corresponding runoff coefficients associated with a development in Zone 1 for particular values of DCIA and curve number. Now, if you wanted to calculate a C value for a particular site, you would have to iterate, in fact double iterations, between DCIA and curve number values to get your estimated C value. The BMP trains model conducts these iterations for you. So you simply enter in the zone in which your project is located and it conducts the proper iteration depending upon whether you're in zone 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 for the values of DCIA and non-DCIA curve number that you input into the model. We also found an interesting relationship between C values, curve number, and percent DCIA. 
it turns out that DCIA is linearly related to C values, implying that increases in DCIA result in a corresponding linear increase in the calculated C value. However, curve numbers are exponentially related to C values, meaning that there's very little difference in curve, in curve numbers, uh, in the impacts of curve numbers on C values until you get up to about 60 or so, and then the impacts become exponential. Now this has some, some significant impacts with respect to averaging curve numbers, which is commonly done by engineers. This tells us that when you're averaging curve numbers more than about 50 or 60, simply taking a linear uh, arithmetic average of the two values is inappropriate and will result in an inappropriate estimation, an inaccurate estimation of the C value. That's another reason why uh, Harper and Baker chose to separate out the DCIA values into a separate calculation rather than averaging those together because you would be averaging a large curve number of 98 for the impervious areas with smaller numbers resulting in uh, inaccuracies in estimation of C value. Let's look at a quick example of how runoff would be calculated in the BMP trains model. Let's say that we have a 90 acre single family residential development that has five acres of stormwater management systems and five acres of wetlands that are to be preserved. The residential area is covered with lawns. They're in good condition in hydrologic soil group D. All right, the residential areas will be 25% impervious and three quarters of that will be DCIA. So the impervious area is 25% of the 90 acres or 22 and a half acres. The DCIA is going to be 75% of that or approximately 16.88 acres. And as a percentage of the total development, it's 18.7%. Now sometimes calculations look at DCIA in terms of the percentage of the impervious area, but in this case, the tables included in the BMP trains model view the DCIA percentage as a total, uh, as a ratio of the total development area. The next thing that you do is you calculate the composite non-DCIA curve number, assuming that uh, we have a lawn in good condition in hydrologic soil group D, that corresponds to a curve number of 80. The area of the lawns would be the total project area, 90 acres, minus the impervious area, which gives us 67 and a half acres of lawns. The impervious area, which is not DCIA, we subtract the impervious area minus the DCIA, and we have 5.6 acres of impervious areas that do not discharge directly into the storm water system. So we calculate a composite curve number for those and we end up with a curve number of 81.4. All right, let's assume that this project is in Pensacola, which is in zone one. So we look for zone one with a DCIA of 18.75% and a non-DCIA curve number of 81.4 and the BMP trains model predicts that the annual C value for that development will be 0 0.304. From the annual rainfall isopleth maps available in the BMP trains model, we determine the annual rainfall for the Pensacola area to be about 65 and a half inches. So the generated annual runoff volume is the 90 acres of the developed site times 65 and a half inches times 0.304 which gives us about 149 acre feet per year. However, if this project was in Key West in zone 3, we have the same project parameters, but now the annual C value is only 0 0.266. 
and the annual rainfall for the Key West area is approximately 40 inches, again obtained from the isopleth maps available in the BMP trains model. The generated annual runoff volume is then 90 acres times 40 inches per year of rain times a C value of 0.266 or about 79.8 acre feet per year. So the same project in Key West generates approximately half of the rain of the runoff that the project uh, would generate if it was constructed in the Pensacola area. In summary, just like rainfall, runoff in Florida is highly variable, depending upon where you Let's start over. I click, clicked a button. In summary, rain, just like rainfall, runoff in Florida is highly variable. It depends upon the impervious area. It depends upon the non-DCIA curve number value. And it depends upon characteristics of rain events depending upon where you're located within the state. The BMP trains model takes all of these factors into consideration and calculates an annual C value and an annual runoff value based upon the site-specific hydrologic and meteorological characteristics of the project site.